In the dark of the midnight have I oft hid my face while the storms howl above me and there's no hiding place. Mid the crash of the thunder, precious Lord, hear my cry, keep me safe till the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Many times Satan whispered, there is no need to try. There's no end of sorrow, there's no hope by and by. But I know thou art with me, and tomorrow I'll rise where the storms never darken the skies. When the long night is ended and the storms come no more, let me stand in thy presence on that bright, peaceful shore. In that land where the tempest never comes, Lord, may I dwell with thee when the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe, keep me safe till the storm passes by. Maybe up a little too high for me to do, but thank you, Brenda. Happy Father's Day again to you, fathers. I, I'm playing around with that ending. I contemplated dropping down an octave. Didn't know if I could pull that off. And some of you that know music, you know what that's about. But uh, I decided not to, and that makes it a little strainy. But at any, way, at any rate, happy Father's Day. I'm going to start out with a question which is like non-Father's Day random question. Have you ever thought you knew the words of a song, but later found out that you had them wrong? Well, I'm guessing that most of us have done that. Uh, so I'm going to see if, if I'm the only one who had these words wrong, or if you had the same problem. So here's the song. In my own little corner, in my own little, what's the next word? In my own little corner, in my own little. We're like, I've never heard the song. Well, it's a song that Cinderella sang. And it was written by, uh, in 1957 by Oscar Hammenstein II. Uh, the the uh, words were, the music was written by Richard Rodgers. Uh, not to be confused with the Richard Rodgers of the Green Bay Packers. Uh, and I'm sure maybe those names, those names don't ring a bell, but Rodgers and Hammerstein probably does for the over 50 crowd, okay? So Cinderella sang this song, and it goes like this. In my own little corner, I always thought in my own little corner, in my own little world, but it's in my own little corner, in my own little chair, I can be whatever I want to be. Anybody ever remember hearing that before? No? Okay. Well, get used to it because there's a push for it to become the new national anthem. I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious, of course, but is there anyone else bothered by this movement 
in my own little corner, in my own little chair, I can be whatever I want to be, and you have to agree that's what I am, even if that's what I am not. Isn't that what's, what's happening now in our society? Students in some area schools can self-identify as a cat or a dog or a turtle, and the school has to make special provisions for them, litter pans, food. I'm not sure if fire hydrants are part of that equation, but you can <laughs> figure that out on your own. Um, but I do know this. If you don't play along with them, you are bullying them. If you speak the truth, you are bullying them. I was at a school board meeting in our town, Nasita, yes, a school board meeting where a mom passionately got up. Her, her two daughters got in trouble, never been in trouble in their whole high school. Uh, they were in trouble, and this mom passionately said, we are setting these young people up for failure to pretend they are an animal. They'll never get a job as a dog or a cat. I, man, I'm like, I didn't say out loud, preach it, girl, but I mean, you know, she she was letting them know. Now, on the flip side, there are some people that are have some fun with it. I, I had a friend, a guy I worked with down in Madison, and he says to me, hey, Mikey, you think the Madison police would arrest a monkey? I said, why do you ask? He's like, because I have this urge to self-identify as a monkey and go jump on car hoods in a parking lot. <laughs> All right. So anyway, but actually this one's even better. Get an argument. I didn't come up with this. All right. I saw this on Facebook. Get in an argument with somebody and then tell them they have to agree with you because you are self-identifying as the smartest person in the world. Right? Hey, I'm the smartest person in the world. I'm, that's my self-identification. You have to be wrong. I have to be right because I'm the smartest person. So some of it is obviously crazy. Some of it is absurd. Uh, it's actually sad. But nothing, all jokes aside, nothing is as bad as self-identifying as a child of God when you really aren't. Nothing is as bad as self-identifying, saying you are, believing you are, when you really are not. You can self-identify. Again, I'm not trying to be disgusting, but you can self-identify for a dog and a cat, but if your parents started putting roadkill on your plate for dinner, you'd probably snap out of it. And you can, you know, uh, self, you, you can make a conscious choice to ignore your God-given private parts uh, and later choose to give your high heels and dress to someone who really is a biological woman. Uh, but nothing has, those things don't have eternal consequences like self-identifying as a child of God when really you aren't. There's a lot of people in a lot of churches right now that in their mind, they are a child of God, but they really aren't. If you really aren't, the eternal consequences are Jesus saying to you, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Self-identifying is not enough. We need to know. And I, I think we, I don't think I'm going out on a limb to suggest that, that this self-identifying movement, that Satan's behind it. Because it's based on lies, and Satan, like we talk about in Sunday school, Satan is the father of lies. But Satan lie, doesn't lie just for the sake of lying. Satan has a purpose behind his lying. He has goals. Satan has goals for your life. What? Yeah, Satan has goals for your life. If you are not really a child of God, he wants you to think you are one. 
And if you really are a child of God, he wants you to doubt that. So this morning, I'm going to focus more not on um, fathers being better fathers, but I, I want us to look at the aspect of the fatherhood of God and making sure we are indeed children of God. And so uh, take your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 4. If you're using a pew Bible, Galatians chapter 4, it's your own Bible toward the back. Pew Bible, it's page 861. 861, Galatians 4, it talks about God as our Father, it talks about adoption. And uh, Galatians 4, hopefully you found it. Don't be afraid to use your table of contents if you need to. Galatians 4, verse number 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So this morning we're going to be looking at the proof and privileges of being a child of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage. Uh, we thank you for the reminder that you are willing to be the father of all those that come to you through Christ. Uh, we thank you for your love in sending Christ and that we can be forgiven and we can be adopted because he paid our price for us. And uh, we thank you for that love. We thank you for that grace. We thank you for the truth of your word uh, that tells us we can know right now that we're your children. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you'd help us now as we uh, put aside the, the cares of the day and the plans of the day and what we have going on after church and maybe even this week and just be able to focus on uh, who you are and uh, lord i thank you that you know hearts there might be some here right now might be some listening now some listening later that uh, are not saved they've not uh, trusted christ they they think they might be children of god but they really aren't and i just pray that you would use your word uh, to speak to hearts and to uh, show us what your word says. Lord, help us to be not just hearers but with our ears, but also with our hearts. Uh, thank you, Lord, that you take uh, this poor vessel and these uh, efforts and you use them in our lives. And I pray that we would want that. And I ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So number one on your outline, look at verses four and five again. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. A lot could be said. In fact, these are, I think I've preached on these at Christmas time before. When the fullness of time was come, God came, God sent uh, his son, and a lot could be said, but the main point is this. From the, the main point I, I just want us to see from verses 4 and 5 uh, is this. God sent forth his son, Jesus, to come to earth to die to redeem us so that we could be adopted. It is a historical fact that Jesus came to earth and died. The history book Books that deny God will admit that. A man came, Jesus was on earth. He died. But the theological truth behind that is he came to redeem us. To redeem us means to purchase our freedom from the penalty of sin. Jesus purchased our freedom from the penalty of sin, and he did that. Revelation 1.5 says this, Unto him, in some of these verses I have on your outline, 
Now this one I do unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's, that's redemption. Our freedom from the penalty of our sins was purchased when Christ died on the cross for us. And so it's a historical fact that Jesus came, and it's a theological truth that Jesus came and died to pay the penalty of our sins, but it is also a sad reality that not everyone goes to heaven. In fact, Jesus said most people do not go to heaven. I have on your outline Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Jesus' words, Enter ye in at the straight gate, which is the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. There is really no way to interpret this verse from the lips of Jesus other than more people are on the wrong path than are on the right path. So where is the disconnect? If it's a historical fact that Jesus came, and it was in the purpose and the plan and the desire of God, the reason Jesus came was to die for our sins so that people can be forgiven, why aren't, why isn't everyone saved? Because the end of the verse reminds us that we might receive the adoption of sons. Just because Jesus came and died and died for the penalty of our sins does not make it automatic for us. We need to receive that gift for ourselves. How do we receive adoption? We have to receive God's son, right? Adoption is tied up in Christ. I have, I think I just gave you these references, but you've heard me say them before. Some of you know them, John 1, 12, but as many as received him, Jesus, to them gave he power or the authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. What happens when we receive Jesus? When we receive Jesus, we possess Jesus. When we possess him, we have him. When we have him, we have eternal life, right? He that hath the Son hath life, First John 5, 12. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. We can know right now whether or not we have the Son. Yeah. We need to receive Christ, though. And when we do, we are right now heaven-bound. Fail to receive Jesus. Some people think you have to do super bad. No, just ignore him. Just don't see the need. Just don't see the urgency. Just don't do anything. You fail to receive Jesus, you don't have him. And you don't have eternal life. And I think some of the, the saddest words in the Bible are John 5.40. Jesus said, but you will not come to me that you might have life. He extends eternal life. He extends himself. He extends forgiveness, but he says, you won't come to me that you might have life. So what about you? Has there been a time in your life when you've transferred your trust from yourself and your works and what you do, you transferred your trust from those things and put them on Christ and Christ only? If you've done that, you have been adopted and you are right now a child of God. Amen. Amen. But if you haven't, you're not adopted, and you are not a child of God. Number two on your outline, the present, i got to say it slow for the young people, the present position of sonship. I'm looking at you, Graham. The present position of sonship. He's trying to, trying to keep up. Verse number six, and because ye are sons. Because you are sons right now. If you have received Christ right now, you are a child 
of God. You are not on probation to become a son. You are not on, you know, it's not temporary to see if you live up. If you have Christ right now, you are a son right now. It's not probationary. It's not temporary. 1 John 3, 2, beloved, now are we the sons of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is, right now, present, current tense, a new creature. Verse number 7, wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. Not a future son, but a current, present, right now, and forever son. But what does Paul mean when he says you're no more a servant? Aren't we supposed to serve God once we're saved? Yes. But Hebrews 12.28 says as much, and so does Ephesians 2.10. Hebrews 12.28 says, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Ephesians 2.10 talks about we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So we, we are supposed to serve, but we serve because we are sons of God. We do not serve to become a child of God, and we do not serve to stay a child of God. We serve and we love because we are a child of God. I think... We don't think on that enough right now. You, if you have, but I don't feel, but I do this, but I, right now, if you have Christ, you are a child of God. Amen. Nothing changes that fact. But how do we know? How do we know? Paul goes on to give us number three, the proof of our sonship, the proof of sonship. Verse number six says, And because you are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Again, God proves that you are his child. He confirms that you belong to God by giving us the spirit of his son. Hath given us. Doesn't say might give us. Does not say, uh, if you earn it, I'll give it. Um, has already given us the spirit of the Son. So who's the spirit of the Son? Kind of a strange phrase. It's usually not uh, said that way. The spirit of his Son is the Holy Spirit. When did God send forth the spirit of Jesus into your hearts? That's what the verse says. Sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts. When did God do that? When you trusted Christ. You know, it's interesting. You, you have... Uh, some of you maybe trusted Christ when you were young, um, very young, four or five years old. You didn't understand a lot of these theological truths, but whether you understand it or not, if you trust Christ, the moment you trust Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in. He indwells you. So what does the Holy Spirit do in the life of Jesus? God says, my proof that you belong to me is I put the Holy Spirit in you. Well, let's think about what the Holy Spirit did in Jesus' life, first of all, as the perfect God-man. Jesus served God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 10.38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So Jesus served God through the Holy Spirit. Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit. Luke 4, 1, Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost, returned to Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Uh, Jesus was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 11. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus dwell from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Jesus from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies by the Spirit that dwelleth in you. The Holy Spirit raised Jesus 
the Holy Spirit will someday raise us. So what is the Holy Spirit? God says, when you accepted Christ, I gave you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came into your hearts. What does the Holy Spirit do in us? What does the Holy Spirit do in us? Well, the same thing. The Holy Spirit allows us to serve God. Uh, the Holy Spirit leads us. The Holy Spirit someday will raise us from the dead. We will have a body like his body. The Holy Spirit also, Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. If you have a desire to serve God, it's because God put that in you. The Holy Spirit put that in you. God gives us the desire and God gives us the ability to serve him. What else does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit produces the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace. Uh, thankfully, I believe I have two monkey daughters back there. I believe they will, maybe only if I pay them enough, but I think they would agree that I have changed since they were little. I have changed. I have grown in the faith. God has produced his spirit in me more. And there were times in their young life that I wish I was different. I wish I was like I am now, more mature in the faith. But God, the Holy Spirit, does that. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the one. Verse number six, again, look at it. Because your sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Abba is Daddy, Daddy, Father. But it's interesting. Here it says the Spirit is the one that cries. The Spirit is the one that gives us that understanding and that sense and really that assurance that we are the children of God. I gave you Romans 8, 16 on your outline. The Spirit itself, I think himself is better. The Spirit is not an it. The Spirit is a person. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. There's objective truth. God says it. But there's also subjective where sometimes we, we, you know, a feeling and assurance in your, if assurance, assurance is a feeling. You know, let's be, and, and God says, you can have this sense of belonging to God, being his and him being yours, because the Holy Spirit produces that in our heart. Now, you're not going to feel that if you're living in sin. You're not going to feel that if you're purposely doing wrong. You don't sense that closeness. But God says, I put the Holy Spirit in you, and, and his spirit bears witness with us that we belong to God. So is the Holy Spirit inside of you? Do you have a desire to serve God? Do you have a desire to please God? Are you bothered by sin? Those are all things that the Holy Spirit does. Uh, the Bible says, the Lord knoweth them that are his, but we also can know whether or not we are his. Number four, the privileges of sonship. The privileges of sonship. And again, I'm using son a lot. I'm not leaving out daughters, okay? Not leaving out the ladies. Uh, what are the privileges of being a son or a daughter of God? Well, way too many to cover in just a point of a sermon. And these are things we already know, but they're good to be reminded of. We know from Romans 8, 38 and 39, that nothing will separate us from the love of God. We know from Hebrews 13, 5, that nothing uh, will cause God to leave us or forsake us. We know from Matthew 6, we looked at a week or so ago, that the Father will provide for our needs. We know from verse 7, Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God. What does it mean to be an heir of God? Way more than we can comprehend. How can you, and, and I, you know, I don't do this often, 
But when you think of inheritance, sometimes it's natural to think about human inheritance. And I got this from that person, and I got nothing from that person, and I got this from that person. And But how can you really... Our kids already know we're spending their inheritance, so they aren't worried about it. They don't think about it. And I always joke with my wife, I always make sure that I am I am worth more living than I am dead, so you don't have the life insurance too high. But um, all jokes aside, how can you truly imagine the inheritance of the richest, wisest, eternal father in the world. How can we even imagine that inheritance? Romans 8, 17, here it says we're heirs of God. Romans 8, 17 says we're joint heirs with Christ. That means everything that Jesus inherits, we will inherit. 1 Peter 1, 4, just one verse, says this, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Our inheritance won't lose its value. I have a 401k that I just keep watching go down the wrong way. And I'm like, man, Mike, I'm glad I don't think of that as real money. It's just monopoly money, but it should be nice to see it go the other way. Uh, Sorry, girls, that's part of it. But um, but our inheritance from God never loses its value, uh, is pure, undefiled, does not fade away. It, it will not decay. It is untainted. It is perfect, and it is eternal. Number five. Am I going fast? I feel like I missed a page of my notes or something. I'm cruising right along. I don't know. Number five. Those of you sitting there are like, no, Pastor, you've been here forever. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, Number five. <laughs> Those with little ones anyway, right? I'm glad, that, I'm glad the grandkids are in here. Yeah. Number five. Some practical applications because of our sonship. Practical applications because of our sonship. I have letter A, how we relate to one another within the family. How we relate to one another within the family. So you know the answer to this question. The question is this. If God had sent his son for us to become a son... What is our relationship with Jesus? He's our brother. We don't think of it like that very often, do we? He is our brother. Hebrews 2.11 says he is not ashamed to call them, believers, brethren. He is not ashamed to call believers brethren, but what about us? Are we ashamed to associate with him. Second, if we, if I become a child of God, and you and you and you and you are a child of God, that means we're siblings. We have the same father. I think I told you this before. I had a Christian friend I used to work with, and every time he greeted me, he'd say, my brother, my brother from another mother. Uh, we had the same father, but that's what he liked to, and he was loud. Uh, we had fun with that. But we are siblings. Do we care for one another like we're siblings? Uh, we should, our, some of our closest relationships should be in the family of God, and a lot of times they're in the family of God, and there's stronger relationships than in our physical families. It's a blessing when you can have both. A close physical friendship and family tie based on a relationship with the Lord. It's a blessing to have both. Sometimes we don't have 
both. So how is your relationship with fellow believers? Another application is this. How, letter B, how we represent the family name. How we represent the family name. I can say with 100% certainty that none of you ever said, we don't do that because we're monkeys. You know how I know you, didn't, you never said that because you're not monkeys. You wouldn't say that. But I also can say this because I have some one current monkey out in the other room and two former monkeys in the pew back there. I don't know if you know, Abby's actually a medical doctor. She's like, I call her I call her MD sometimes because she's a middle doctor, but it's not medical doctor, it's middle daughter. But anyway, I am pretty sure I never said to them that I recall we don't do that because we're monkeys. I don't think I said that because what I did try to say, and hopefully more than once, don't quiz them afterwards, please, but um, I tried to say we don't do that because we are children of God. We belong to God's family. So what about us? How do we represent our heavenly father? You know, when you're in a physical family, when you're born into a physical family, you don't get to decide if you represent your family name. It's automatic. You are, whether you want or not, you're representing the family name and you're representing your father. Uh, you get to decide how you're going to represent it, but you don't get to decide if you do or not. But the same is true with our spiritual family. If you are in the family of God, you represent God as your father and you represent the family of God. Again, you don't get a choice. The choice is how are you going to represent your father and your spiritual family? Good news, maybe, is I'm done preaching. The bad news is I'm going to start meddling. You know what that means, right? Is the way you talk a good reflection on the family of God. Believers have found ways to swear politely. I've told you I'm meddling, okay? Swear politely. What do I mean? Glad you asked. If I say, what the heck? and I don't even like saying that for illustration purposes, I am really saying what the H-E double, hockey H -E double hockey sticks is, right? That's what I'm really saying. Is there anything wrong with the word hell? No, not if you're talking about the place. But if you're not talking about the place, should you be using the word? I don't think so. Not only... Told you I was meddling, right? Uh, not only how we talk, but what we talk about. We have some young men in here. We have some young teenage men in here. Young men, what do you talk about when you're with the boys and only the boys or even at the workplace? What do you talk about when you're just with the guys? No mom, dad, teacher, other ears around. What do you talk about? Would you talk about the same things if Jesus was standing there physically? Uh, let's not forget, God is always there, right? What about how we dress? Are we careful about how we dress, ladies? Do we remember guys are sight-driven, not like we're different. How we dress can affect what men think about even in church. Did I tell you I was meddling? Yeah. 
So I'm done for now. And I'm almost done preaching. But I want to I wanna end where I started. Please don't miss this point. Do not miss this point. Don't think for a moment that what you do gets you into heaven. Talking right, talking about the right things, dressing right, doing this, doing that, doing all those things. None of those things get you to heaven. Self-identifying as a child of God does not make it so. We need to have Christ. You need to have the Son. Do you have the Son? You know, wouldn't it be awesome if God is not your Father? Wouldn't it be awesome to have God be your Father on Father's Day? What a, what, what a better day than that. To have God actually become your Heavenly Father. He wants to be. But, of course, we need to receive Christ in order for that to happen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we uh, just thank you for uh, your word. Uh, Lord, we thank you that we can receive the adoption of sons, uh, meaning we can become a child of yours, whether man or woman, boy or girl. Uh, we can become your child right now. And we can also know after we have trusted Christ, that we belong to you. And Lord, I know Satan wants to, to rob us from that. He wants us to doubt that we're your children now. Uh, Satan wants us to think we have to prove things to remain your child. Uh, we don't have to, and we thank you that we're in your family once we trust Christ. Uh, but Lord, you know the hearts, and you know if there's any here that are trusting in themselves and what they do instead of trusting in Jesus and Jesus only. Uh, help them to see that they do not know what a day may bring forth and that they need to be ready uh, to meet Christ now, uh, meet you now. And so you... You work in hearts, Lord. I pray specifically, if there's some here that don't know Christ, that you would really be bothering their hearts and that they would want to get that settled today. Yeah. And Lord, if there's things that you spoke to us about, uh, I pray that we would respond in the way you desire. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what does God want us to do? We hear the word of God. Again, I'm, I'm a teacher. I enjoy teaching. I enjoy explaining things, but it's not just for the sake of gathering information. God wants us to do something with what we've heard. First, make sure you're a child of God, right? That's the number one thing. Make sure you are a child of God. Don't put off asking Christ to be your Savior. You know, I got a text from my sister Wednesday and said, you know, that. Alex, her son-in-law's dad, had a heart attack and died Wednesday. No one that morning in that family woke up and said, one of us is going to die today. We don't do that. But we aren't certain of tomorrow. So we need to make sure. Are you a child of God? Second, if you are a child of God, enjoy that truth. Dwell on that. Be right now. Get out of this performance attitude of I need to do, 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 do to stay a child of God. I am right now a child of God, and I need to enjoy that. But I also need to evaluate, am I representing the family well? Uh, you know, my, my heartbeat as a pastor is that we all grow in holiness, in humility, that we become more and more Christ-like, that the fruit of the Spirit is seen in us more and more. If we never get our toes stepped on, we'll never take seriously that we need to change, right? Art and Don and Brenda are going to come. We're going to sing, I am his and he is mine. I